just this is random. I was looking at IMDb yesterday, and the very top thing on the bulletin board was, is this Doctor Who? Uh-huh. I just thought it was hysterical. Is it? Well, it's interesting because there's obviously they have a lot of similarities. We, yeah. we even cut a commercial. I don't know if you saw it, a trailer that sort of plays on the whole Doctor Who thing. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and okay. the similarity. Yeah, because Peabody, which who officially came first, just yeah. want to point that out, with the bow tie and the time traveling way back machine, <laughs> right. predates Doctor Who, but only by like a year or two. So, coincidence? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, who knows? I wasn't around then. Um, but yes, no, there's definitely a, a Peabody Who kind of symmetry. Why so. Why now to make this film? Because I, I <clears throat> didn't even realize how old this was until I right. talk, told my mom this morning, and she was like, oh, I love that. When I was, I was <laughs> right, like, right. are you serious? <laughs> right. So, why now? Is well, no one had do? done it before. Yeah. And I actually got involved in this 12 years ago. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I mean, it could have happened 12 years ago. Yeah. So why then? I don't know. But it hadn't happened. No one had thought about doing it. Nobody wanted to do it, I guess. Uh, but 12 years ago, I, I thought it would be a great, you know, sort of great characters mm-hmm. and a great premise. And, and the time travel was still relevant. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it seemed, even though it was a, a property that was, you know, on you know, many, many, many years ago, it just seemed like there were so many elements to it that felt fresh and felt kind of modern. And, and it was, you know, it's kind of a fun thing to sort of take and, and update in a way. Uh, that, that's, that's why. So is that why you decided to go 3D? Well, it's an interesting thing. 12 years ago, we didn't even think about 3D. So it wasn't an issue at all. And when I brought it to DreamWorks in 2005, I don't think they were really fully thinking 3D either. So it happened somewhere between the time I brought it to DreamWorks and, and getting into production, which was starting three years ago. Um, and, and at that point, DreamWorks had made a decision for the company, and DreamWorks Animation had made a decision that they were going to make all their movies in 3D. So it wasn't even, no one said, do you want to do it or not want to do it? It was like, well, we're doing it in 3D because that's the way we do movies here. So, <clears throat> Well, kind of going back to what she was asking about why now, how hard was it to take? Because even though it was a popular cartoon, it was still kind of an bus- obscure cartoon. How hard was it to get somebody to want to make this film? Well, you know, it's interesting. The first meeting I had on the project 12 years ago was like the best meeting, uh, you know, when you go and pitch a project and uh, someone buys it in the room. You know, they, you pitch it and they, they loved it. It was a company called Walden Media that, that was famous for the Narnia movies. Um, in fact, is Phil Anschutz from Texas, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know Phil Anschutz? Anyway, so um, so they said yes. They wanted to make the movie, but there were some issues with the chain of title because the property had been around for such a long time. And Tiffany Ward, who's Jay Ward's daughter, has been managing. Do you know Jay Ward? Paul Winkle, yeah. George right. of the Jungle. So <clears throat> Jay Ward's daughter, Tiffany, has been managing all the properties for 24 years. And yet there were some open issues. And so they wanted to make the movie, but then they had to kind of say, we, ha- we can't go forward until these legal issues are sorted out. And it took her almost a year to figure all of that out. By the time that was done, we went back to them and they said, we're still interested, but we have a whole different kind of a business model because they invested 200 plus millions of dollars into movies, mm-hmm. um, not all of which they were getting back from those investments and so the owner of the company said and it was all his personal money so the owner of the company said maybe we should let's look for partnership we need to get people to come in for 50% of the financing who also can distribute the films because that's another enormous part of the recipe for success in the film business is you need a a partner who can distribute the film so then we went on a, a quest for many years, actually trying to figure out who might be interested and willing to be a partner. But I didn't think DreamWorks was an option because DreamWorks had been developing all their properties in-house. So Shrek was done in-house and Kung Fu Panda and Madagascar and all these things were done kind of homegrown. And so I just didn't think that they were an option. But I had worked years before with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who's the owner of DreamWorks mm-hmm. at Disney. And so we'd worked together on The Lion King, and, um, and and I got word that he might be interested, and so we went and met with Jeffrey about it. Jeffrey got excited about the project and said yes. This was in 2005. He said yes to the movie, but he said no to Walden, which was interesting, because Walden kind of came in and, and had to kind of bow out. The reason they did is because they didn't have, they didn't want to put up all the financing, and at, at that point we hadn't been able to find any other partnership. And so Jeffrey said he wanted to take the whole thing and do it all himself. 
And so we started development of the project in 2005 with DreamWorks. And it's interesting because the woman who is the producer, Alex Schwartz, who's on the, who has been on the movie for three years, uh, w worked for Walden when I met them. And she actually came with us to the meeting, in that first meeting with Jeffrey, and Jeffrey basically said, you know, yes to me and no to her in a sense. And, uh, and then I thought I would never see her again. But then years later, probably three years later, I come to a meeting at DreamWorks and she had been hired as the head of development. It's just totally separately and independently. Yeah. So that was kind of amazing. I saw Alex again. It was great to see her. She was sort of back working on the movie, which was great. And uh, and then the executive producer, Jason Clark, who was actually the producer of the movie, because we'd gotten the rights back in 12 years ago, uh, Jason was the producer of uh, Stuart Little. So this all happened at the time of Stuart Little. <clears throat> so Jason, who's recently produced the movie Ted uh, with Seth MacFarlane, and he's doing A Million Ways to Die in the West with Seth MacFarlane. And doing all of that, um, basically three years ago had to, you know, sort of had other things that he needed to focus on. And so Alex Schwartz, who was head of development, left that position and ended up coming on to our movie full time as the producer. So she, so she's uh, been with us ever since. Um, that's kind of how it all happened. I'm not sure that answered anybody's question. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the intellectual characters. You've yeah. got the, intel the smart dog, yes. and you've got the smart kid. And we're talking about timing, like why now? Um, my first question is going to be about, do you feel that, because the geek is now cool, yeah. you know, being smart and knowing things. Um, talk, do you, can you relate with Sherman? Were you that child that knew all this stuff, traveled places, or did you wish that you were that child? Or it's interesting. I think that's actually a subtle, the subtle difference between our Sherman and the original Sherman, because our Sherman is a, is as smarter, is a brighter kid, right? And he's been on all of these time traveling adventures and has learned something. I think the original Sherman was a bit of a cipher for Peabody, so he was a, really a foil. Peabody would say. Here, Sherman, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Marie Curie, and da, 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 we're going to learn about uh, Jonas Salk. I can't remember ex exactly, him, but still, he would, he would. <clears throat> but it was all Peabody, and Sherman would just be, be like, "Hi, Mr. Peabody, what are we going to see today?" <laughs> there really wasn't anything. There really wasn't much going on there. So then we thought, well, if we're going to make this into a movie, we have to sort of take the characters a little bit more seriously. We have to think about who they actually really are as characters. Like, they have to be real characters. And so Sherman, I think, went through the biggest transformation. But we thought, you know, if Sherman's Mr. Peabody's son, obviously you'd want to give that sense of the influence that Mr. Peabody has had on Sherman. So Sherman can sometimes be quite naive. But then at other times, obviously, in the classroom, he, can, he shows that he has been paying attention to some of what Mr. Peabody's been teaching him. But yes, but the question was about the geek being cool? Yes. Like, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I think, but that's been true for maybe more than, no? That's just like today? Maybe five years. Five years. Much. What do you cite? Well, because the, like, I think the, the reason Doctor Who and all these other ones are starting to come into America is because now it's okay to talk about sci-fi. Just curious right. about the timing. Just sort of coincidental, I guess. I mean, okay. I guess, you know, if you're like, if you're, I mean, I guess... You know, I'm a geek, so I guess I have to be honest with you. So I guess maybe that's it. You don't think about, you know, other, like whether that's cool or not. It's nice. It's awesome. So, okay, so it's been such a long time to make, or to make this movie, I guess, happen. But how long did you actually spend creating the movie? Well, like from the production, like they greenlit the movie uh, in 2011. Okay. So that was like three years ago. Okay. So they, they basically called up and said, we're, we're ready to go, ready to commit to the movie. So it's been three full full years, solid years of production. How long did the animation take? Well, it usually breaks down to six months of prep, 18 months of actual production. So I, I would say a year and a half of animation, roughly, give or take. Maybe a little bit less. Maybe a 12. It's usually 12 to 18 months, I guess. I, I don't know what it is on, on, on this movie, actually, because... Once you start going, there's a there's a giant chart with colored bars and graphs that yeah. show exactly when we start this and end this, and 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 it's a lot to it's a lot to think about when you're making a movie. You sort of like I don't want to know what I, I'd rather try to focus on what we're doing. What's what's the job at hand? You know. Yeah. Um, but but there probably if you want to know the actual data, I'm sure we can figure that out for you. I must know. But it's a, it's between twelve. <laughs> I would say between twelve and eighteen months for sure. Okay. <laughs> When you went to uh, cast the film, sure. 
how much thought was put to not just the, the Peabody Sherman voices, but the, the family that they're going to interact with. Oh, the Petersons? Yes. A lot of thought. I mean, that's a, you know an important part of creating a, an animation character is finding the voice, and the voice is you know a big, big part of, of the character. Um, so yeah, I mean, we we sort of actually it's interesting because Stephen Colbert was actually one of the people that we considered um, as a Mr. Peabody. We thought he might be a kind of a great Mr. Peabody, and we actually did call and, and ask if he'd be interested. This was before Ty Burrell, uh, and and his response was that. He loved the original show. He was a big fan and would love to do anything except Mr. Peabody because it was not going to work for his schedule because he's so busy. So he said that's the only thing he wouldn't do, but he'd do anything else. And so we, we, you know, we were like, great, let's work with Stephen Colbert because he's so, I mean, I think he's so amazing and funny. And uh, so we were, you know, devising the, the characters of the parents and we sort of thought, you know, Penny is a, is a girl who's very smart, very strong-willed, and, you know, definitely has an edge. And we thought, you know, she has to get it from somebody. So probably it's going to be her parents, or at least one of them. So sort of like the dad was a bit of a, of a you know, a tough, you know, sort of critic and a little, you know, a little, uh, you know, judgmental, shall we say. <laughs> so it seemed like a good, a, good, a good role for Stephen Colbert. And I have to tell you, I was so nervous meeting him the first time because I'm a big fan. And so when you're a fan of somebody and you meet them, you're like really worried that they're going to not live up to your expectations or they're going to be yeah. like, and he's so smart and so funny. I thought, oh my God, he could be a, just a jerk. You know? <laughs> and so so we got into the to the session with him and he showed up and I was so pleased to, to discover that he's really, really a nice man. Super friendly, collaborative. He's a family man. Like re- just really like a great guy. You know, really, really, really down to earth. So that was that was very nice. And, and just a consummate performer and gives it his all. We have great footage. We typically record um, the actors as they're as they're performing so that the animators can actually use it as reference. And uh, he would just throw himself into it like 110%, <laughs> just like physicalize everything and just go through these great gyrations. And I remember the scene when Mr. Peabody adjusts his back and he goes through this very long kind of drawn out thing and he literally like put his entire body into it. It was really, really, really funny. <laughs> He's great. And yes. Oh, when you're when you're dealing with the animation, um, I know like because I do a cartoon, uh, like a web strip. So it's a lot of it's done in layers. So when you're doing a film, and even possibly hoping to do a franchise, you know it takes a long time to develop the characters and the designs and all that the first time. But do y'all have like archives that you build? So if you go back to revisit them, the characters are already designed, so it speeds up the process. You know, it's interesting. I mean, in general, I think that there's a theory that that's a good idea if it ever can be done. And that the, the reality is it rarely can be done. Um, typically, the technology advances so quickly that, you know, you start on a movie three years out and you're using three-year-old technology. By the time you get to the end of the movie, there have been major updates and changes to the platform. So much so that they typically will have to go back in and redesign the, 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 the original characters. Because they, they don't quite work the way that uh, things have progressed. And so I think everybody would like for that to be the case, but I think it, in practical application it isn't always right. the case. <clears throat> if you had a way back that you could go travel in where history, would I? where would you go? <laughs> well, I, you know, I would, I'd like to say that I would go to uh, Liverpool in the early 60s to, to see the Beatles, Beatles perform for the first time at the Cavern Club. But but I would also I could I could imagine traveling back to 1939 uh, Hollywood in 1939 because some amazing movies got made in that year like Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind just to sort of meet Walt Disney I think that would be an awesome thing to do. So did you spend a lot of time doing research of the old cartoon? I mean, did y'all like really try to mirror that into the? Movie? Yeah, absolutely. And- I mean, I think that to to one degree or another. Many of us who worked on the movie were real fans, so you know I've seen every episode countless times. I grew up with it. I never thought so much that I would make a movie about it when I was a kid, but it was part of my DNA. You know, like when you're that young and you're watching that stuff, and then I would see it repeatedly as I got older, even and kind of gained a new appreciation. Because one of the hallmarks of the J Ward material is that it's filled with jokes and references that are not. You know, going to be obvious to kids. Kids right. aren't necessarily going to get all the jokes. So as you continue to come back to it, you know, you sort of get more and more out of it, which kind of keeps it interesting and fresh. And, uh, and and so I think we all had a little bit of that. Like we knew 
who these characters were the same way I would know who Bugs Bunny was. I mean, I, I don't think I've seen every cartoon countless, countless times and even know the differences between every director of animation that's ever worked up. You know what I mean? So, like, when you're an animation geek, as I am, um, you sort of have that as part of you. So it wasn't so much like we had to come back to it and study it in that way. You know, it wasn't like... Because you'd probably want to do that if you weren't as quite as familiar with the, the property. It was sort of like, you know... They were they were second nature sort of as characters and, and yet watched over the last twelve years certainly I've watched again all all the all the shorts but not not so much in a as a as a you know as a, as a research assignment right you know? because again you know to sort of say if you look at the shorts again you sort of understand the connection and the parallel between the movie and the and the shorts but it's not a copy right. you know what I mean and we weren't really trying to make it exactly the same we we're sort of sort sort of saying. This is the character. This is the premise. This is the situation. These are some of the hallmarks, like the puns, for example. Every episode ended with a pun, and, and so that was obviously something we would want to do in the movie, just because we knew that was like a Peabody thing to do, you know. Um, so that was that was a big part of it. And like I said, Sherman was sort of we liberated ourselves from from what Sherman is in the original show, thinking that if we got a real kid actor to play him, it would just add a lot of different le- texture to the to the to the storytelling. And bring more reality to it, because that's I think what we were sort of saying is that these characters were great characters, but there was a there was they were real characters, and then the movie ended up having to deal ultimately with kind of more of like who they are as characters, not just these adventurous sort of time travel comedy stories, but like it's a father and a son, and he has he adopts him, and there's some issues surrounding the fact that Mr. Peabody's a dog, and how does it affect Sherman, and how does Sherman feel about the fact that, and those were sort of some of the stuff that they never ever addressed in the original show, and it was just a matter of saying, well, what what would those things if you started to look, take the stones and uncover them, you know, sort of say this is what would be there, you know what I mean, without inventing it so much, it's sort of like this is just the kind of like revealing layers of of the character. What has the the progression been like? I mean, Lion King to working now. I mean, sure. it has to be amazing. Oh yeah, changes. I mean, Huge. I believe Lion King it was more conventional animation. Yeah. I think you did. You use computers back we did. then? Yeah. yeah. So we did. There was a little bit. It was the early days of, of computer <laughs> yeah. animation, um, and we did for the wildebeest stampede. We actually created all of the wildebeest in the computer, but it was based on two dimensional animation uh-huh. of wildebeest and a number of. Behaviors were were animated by hand, uh-huh. so these would be behaviors of, of the wildebeest, you know, bucking and running and yeah. moving this way and that way. And then the computer took it and replicated it among uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wildebeest with an extra property, which was interesting, which was a, a collision program in which any two objects would never touch. So they would they could run towards each other, but the minute they got close enough, they would turn, which is actually what a, a real animal would do. Yeah. And so it created this very believable dynamic of the of the animals running, which looked exactly in the same style as the movie because it wasn't per se computer animated, it was yeah. hand drawn animation. But then they were, you know, sort of layered and, and cut and pasted in a sense and, and created that. But that was the, that was the extent of the computer animation. Aside from the there was a thing called the CAP system, which was the um, uh, computer animation post production system. Mm. And, and what that meant was is that uh, unlike the old days at Disney where they would paint cells at every frame, they would actually take a drawing and then trace it with a ink and then they would paint the back of the cell and put that against the, the colored background. We didn't do that anymore. What would, they would do is you would, uh, uh, you would scan the, the, the drawing, which was done on paper the, the old fashioned way. You'd scan it and then it would be in the computer and then the, uh, uh, you could paint the characters on the in the computer. Oh, okay. So that was sort of the beginning again. Yeah. It was a digital enhancement of the yeah. process, but it wasn't. But you know, since obviously Toy Story and and the emergence of computer animation, computer animated movies, and and the kind of the the the, the popularity of the of those movies, and and a kind of you know ubiquity of of that tool. Yeah. Um, you know, DreamWorks was a traditional animation company when they started twenty years yeah. ago. Uh, then they did a movie called Ants, which was the first computer animation they did, and they they decided to convert the entire studio to do computer animation. Um, so yeah, so the the tools have changed dramatically since Lion King, but uh, what's really interesting about it is that making an animated movie today is a lot more like making a live action movie, uh, in the sense that in a live action movie, obviously you've got a camera, 
and you've got actors, and you've got the set, and you've got the lights and the rest of it, and you sort of set up your shots. Uh, you know, if you have a dolly, you know, you're putting your camera on a dolly, you're moving it, and that creates depth because you're looking at it from a changing perspective. Um, and that kind of thing, you would n we would never have done on Lion King, you know, because on Lion King, it's always going to be two-dimensional. And there are some tricks that make it look a little bit more three-dimensional, but not actual three-dimensional. Yeah. And so now, when you make a movie in animation, you literally say, well, let's put the camera here, and let's do a dolly. And it's called a dolly, and there's like a, the, the mechanics of a dolly are actually built into the computer. And then when you light the, the scene, you actually light with virtual lights, the fill light, the kick, the key, and you put you could place them in the three dimensional set. So you're actually making it's like making a live action movie virtually uh, with with the animation part of it. Because what happens is the animator takes the character, does what he does, and then it gets basically fed back into the data that 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 contains com encompasses the whole world. And then and then once the animation is done, you can actually still change the camera. So the the, the character does what it does, but the camera can actually move independently of the character yeah. once the animation is there. Do you miss it? Do you miss the old the animation? I love the old animation, but I don't miss it per se because I think Is you know computer animation. There's so much, there's so much richness and and uh, tactile quality yeah. to it. You know when you see for me Peabody and you see the fur and it's in 3D and you can really kind of go, yeah. wow, how is this possible? Like it looks so real, like you know, and it just exists in, somehow in the in the computer, but it looks really, really real, and it adds, I think, a, a level of interactivity mm -hmm. uh, for the audience to sort of get involved with characters, because I, I think if you see a drawn animation, you know it's drawn, and I think that today, you know it's drawn even more so than you did 20 years yeah. ago. When you saw Lion King drawn, you, you didn't think about it being drawn. You just thought about it being animation. It was like, that's the way animation looked. Yeah. And now if you see it, you're like, oh, I'm very aware of the lines. I'm very aware of yeah. their, that somebody did this, you know, and so it becomes, so, it's, so it slightly removes you from the, from the storytelling in a way that it never did 20 years ago, and now it does. So I think that, that changes it. Yeah. Well, looking at, at uh, the decisions to do some of the things with Peabody, like his ability with the the the, the, the uh, drink mix drink shaker and yeah. and all that how much thought was put into how far you wanted to go with that um, with a family film oh family and, film with, yeah. with with drinking mixing yeah, drinks yeah and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I, well <laughs> yeah well you know we were trying well it's a good point I mean I think we were we were certainly conscious of it. What, but we we're trying not. I mean, obviously, you know, we're we're, we're not making a, an enormous deal. I don't think kids necessarily are. Are <laughs> I don't know that they're. I mean, I don't know. Maybe yeah. they're, they're thinking, oh, it's alcohol or not. I don't know. Maybe or maybe not. I don't know. But I didn't think that that we were making an emphasis on that. And certainly, we weren't making a point about it. But the idea was that it is sort of true to Mr. Peabody's character, and is absolutely something that he would do with the Petersons. And the kids are off. Doing their thing, right? When he's mixing the drinks, it's not like he's certainly not. He's not serving the drinks to the kids or even in front of the kids. So it sort of felt to us like it was a truthful, you know, balance. Well, I loved it. I just, I just. But yes, no, fair I, enough. It was just one of those things. I was, I was thinking about it as I was watching it because, um, you, you, try, you made it more, a lot more truthful. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm a geek too. I, I watched every one of them. I didn't watch Rocky and Bullwinkle. I, I waited for, for, for Peabody. Yeah. And I love the fact that you gave him not just three dimensional view, but you made his, 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 his him so three dimensional with right. the abilities and the, the chiropractic skills and everything. Right. I just, it blew me away. I, oh, I was, I was very happy to see what you did, but I'm just, you know, I'm not sure. How to say this, but you guys. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to ask this question. It's okay. When you when you guys went in the past, yes. How did you guys decide which pieces you wanted to hit? Um, well, that came over a long period of time in the development of the movie, uh, but a, but it it really sort of settled as to where we'd go once we sort of understood a little bit more about. The story of Penny and Sherman, because that wasn't part of the it, three years ago when the studio greenlit the movie. That Penny didn't exist as a character. It was entirely different. It, the whole movie was actually different, and uh, the writers who'd written that draft of the script had to go away because they'd sold the TV show that they had to showrun, and so we had to find a new writer. 
And we knew that we wanted to get more out of the relationship between Peabody and Sherman. And the, the writer we met with is Craig Wright, who's credited as the screenwriter, because Craig came in and basically said, here's an idea. Why don't we change Sherman's nemesis from a boy, which it was in that script, to a girl? Because that will, just that alone is going to change Sherman in ways that's going to affect Mr. Peabody. And, and that idea became, was like such a strong idea that the whole movie got developed from that point, so that it's an entirely different movie today than it was then. Yeah. And, and and so when we were looking at the places we were going to go, we knew that we needed to sort of set up sort of thematic ideas about the relationship between Peabody and Sherman and what might happen and what, where they might need to go. And, of course, you know, when we go to Da Vinci, Da Vinci is sort of Peabody's old friend and <laughs> kind of has a perspective on Sherman and his growing up, right? And when he goes off with Penny. So those they all became ways for us to kind of focus on the character story as opposed to just purely going to a, a, a historical place for its own sake. The only one we really do that with is the, is the first one, is, is the French Revolution, because nothing has really happened in the movie yet. So that one was the one that sort of like, you know, could be anything. But even in that, one of the things we were trying to convey was an idea which which does get repeated, actually, which is when George Washington, when the story about the cherry tree comes up and, you know, Penny says he cut down a cherry tree and Sherman goes, no, that's not true. Right, so the idea of the history maybe isn't always what you expect or think, or maybe we're told things and then it does, turns out to not be true. So that was an interesting idea, and that gets set up in the first scene because Marie Antoinette, who is reported to have said "let them eat cake," apparently never did, and, that, and we all kind of accept as fact that maybe she did say "let them eat cake," and the truth is maybe she never actually said it. Somebody just gave her credit for saying it because it was a great way of explaining what was wrong with her. You know, it was like almost a joke. Like, that's such a terrible thing for her to do. So that I, so that got set up in that idea, kind of for that reason. Awesome. Oh. Oh.